Oh, hi, I'm Robin Hoffman. I'm a public artist here in Char Oh, actually, I'm in Denmark. And some people want to know, what's a public artist? Well, a public artist could be somebody who needs to do a project, and it's usually in the public. And in this instance, I am working on um, trying to figure out, first of all, I'm here in Denmark, and here we have uh, this wonderful um, statue, which has got sort of like a history to it. And it's interesting because, you know, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do this next project. And that's always, uh, for an artist, you have to sort of do a historical, uh, what they call a deconstruction of like why certain things work in the public, like how images work in the public and that sort of thing. And for me, um, I traveled to Denmark and about 30 years ago, and I really, really loved Denmark. But what I didn't realize was why this statue was so fantastic. Like, it, of all the things in, in Denmark, it was so beautiful. Um, the people there, and it's supposed to be like the happiest city uh, uh, in all the world, and um, you know. And then they had this statue, which all the tourists need to see. And I'm like, why do people need to see it? So I started looking at the history of it. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So what happened is Hans Christian Andersen wrote this story. And then the person who um, finally was commissioned to do um, the mermaid herself uh, um, was an artist uh, who was commissioned um, about uh, 19, I think it was 1909. Um, and at that moment, you know, it's a time in history, right? So there's a certain type of mentality, I should say of the way people think about women, the way people think about men, the way people think about who's in charge, all of that. Anyway, so. So here I am. Oh, my goodness. Susan Pro, how are you? Fine, how are you? I'm doing fine. It's so good to see you. See you. What a surprise. Here I am. I'm talking about deconstruction and things about history and why people exhibit certain things. And, you know, I mean, I could go back as far as the Renaissance, right? Or even further. I could go, you know, back in time, biblical times, right? And say, like, why did people decide, you know, certain images should be apparent and that sort of thing? But anyway, I'm sorry, I want to talk about you now that you're here. It's like crazy. <laughs> oh my good, you just like came here. Are you visiting or? Yeah, I've always wanted to see Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, okay, so, but here I need to introduce you a little bit. And first of all, I want to um, say um, how much you inspire me. Um, I have, I have uh, when I was doing this history of my, um, like what I'm going to do my project. I also thought, because I broke my ankle um, for like six months now, I've been sort of homebound. <laughs> it's the first time in my life that I've looked at why I do things, especially art-wise, like why certain images. And then I thought about the images that the artists do historically, like some emperor or some king or some church, right? Commissions an artist. An artist needs to live, right? They have to make a living. So a lot of times they do things just because somebody gives them money so that they can feed their kids, so they can feed themselves, so they can have a place to live, just like any other profession. And people forget that when it comes to like historical. Like this mermaid 
you know, has a story. And there's a significance behind it that is relevant to the period. It has nothing at all to do with... Anyway, so when I'm thinking, I was thinking uh, for six months now, <laughs> I was also thinking about my time in Charlottesville and how um, so many things have changed me as a person from being a New York person. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I guess because of my age and also my experience, but certainly Heather's death still makes me tear up, I know. And I'm sorry to bring it up at this point, but it's certainly uh, one of the things that um, I think about when I think of you. As all the people that inspired me in my life was another thing in six months, right? Um, I had a trigger. My mom was a pro prolific artist. And uh, I never thought about how much she inspired me, but also who made me the woman I am, right? She um, had a school, she had two schools, and I was kind of like her gopher. I used to like do the things that she wouldn't do because um, she was a fine art painter. And I became a commercial painter. Anyway, what I want to say is a long story short, I did a lot of projects all my life based on the fact that I wanted to live as an artist, as a professional artist, and be respected for that. Um, and I think that respect is something that people forget a lot in life. You know, you, you're busy trying to make a living or whatever, and you don't really respect the person for, for what shoes they walk in and that sort of thing. And uh, certainly, I had no idea what kind of person you were, but when you were at the memorial, it gave me, it gave me such strength for what you were saying, you know, in such a circumstance. Um, and as a result, you became proactive. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, what do you want to know? I mean, so how did you did the foundation and this and that? And well, the foundation started because money kept pouring in after we closed the GoFundMe, and I said we got to do something responsible with this money. It's not meant for the family, obviously. Um, we had already um, taken in a fair amount of money for the GoFundMe, and but why did you, what's the premise of this? Well, the premise of the foundation is originally was a scholarship program. Why? Well, for one thing, I had been a school teacher for 18 years, and um, that was something I knew. Alfred, her um, supervisor and coworker, um, had done scholarship programs with his schools, and um, so it just seemed like a logical place to start. But um, it evolved into. Um, not just education but empowerment and we're looking now for ways to empower not just young people but older people too and I'm going to get this paint right here. That's dry. Yep. And um, so we, uh -oh. nope, what do I do? Am I painting the box? <laughs> oh, okay. Just go, just go for it. Um, thank you for helping me. I wasn't going to mention it but I need to do this by the end of uh, our talk. <laughs> this is my project, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Didn't oh, that's okay. You. And um, so we um, have started giving scholarships to adults who are also in college. I didn't go back to uh, grad school until I was a single mom with two small children. And I know that a lot of people go back to college later in life, either start college or go to grad school. So we offer that scholarship as well as the local high school scholarships and um, the, the scholarships go to people who are activists who have already demonstrated uh, themselves to be activists and um, we want to support their education. We feel like knowledge is power and so we're supporting that. But we're also uh, looking at other ways to empower people. So one thing we've done is work with a, a company uh, another nonprofit called The Sum, 
who works on helping people change from the inside out. How do I clean my brush? Is this water? Yeah, here. All right, is this water-based paint? It off, yeah. Okay. Because I got, I wanted to go to yellow next. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're fun. I mean, fine. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, so yeah. So here's the thing. I mean, I'm also it like an green. educator kind of person. Yeah. And so in my life, I I realized that, um, like, as you proceed, right, in life. Yeah. that you realize that people, there's key things that people will say, experience or whatever, that you will talk about for the rest of your career, so to speak. Like you will, you will use that energy or whatever worked as part of your lesson plan, <laughs> as part of the way you proceed in, in giving people the benefit of learning how to learn. Yeah. Right? And right. so, I think what you're doing is amazing because, first of all, you're giving people a focus on something positive. You know, this is a horrible thing uh, that happened, and but it's also uh, why did it happen? You know, I mean, well, the why is important, and sadly, I don't feel like a, I mean, Charlottesville is loaded with nonprofits. But I'm really not seeing a lot of change happen. I see a lot of us talking about change. I'm not seeing a lot of change happen. And it's not that no change is happening, but one of the key issues we have, in, and I apologize for saying we because I don't actually live in Charlottesville, um, is uh, gentrification and not lack of affordable housing. I mean, when you have apartments listed at twenty one thirty two a month. I I don't I don't know what kind of wage they think people are gonna make in order to get that. You can't live you can't get wage to do that. You have to be salary. So so, so you're kicking poor people out of the city, but where are they supposed to go? Right. Hey, here's the thing though. What what I mean by your focus on education. Okay. Is that it gives people choices. As an educator, you know that. Like, if you don't know historically where a statue comes from, right? you're going to make a choice based on the fact that you don't belong to anything. You know, you most likely will, you know, um, listen to people that have an easy way out of your misery if you have misery or whatever. Yeah. And they promise you all these wonderful things like a hotel in the middle of the desert or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I'm saying is that focus is what I saw in you from the, big, the very first time I met you and then every time I saw you after that is that you... Um, you understand what's important and it's because your your intelligence is built on self you know involvement into why 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 well I was always brought up to think in terms of why what caused this but the other thing is I have always viewed uh, the job as a teacher and I do view myself as a teacher I come from a long line of teachers um, is that you take in the information that's there and then if people don't already have that information it's because it's not been presented to them in a way that they understand or it's just not been presented to them. So my job then is to present that information back in a way that's digestible. So I, I, I view it as taking in the information And, and putting it back out so that other people can get it. Yeah, but your 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 training, um, your years of doing that, yeah, it enables you to like I was pointing out the key ingredients for people. Let's say like me who have ADHD. <laughs> you would then give me a box or something to concentrate on so I could listen to you. <laughs> Well, yeah. Right? And I read a crowd. So if the crowd is all sitting there looking at their phones, then I'm not reaching them. So that means I need to change up what I'm saying. I need to get people involved. I need to move around the room. It's all the same techniques for adults, 
that you use for a fourth grade classroom, honestly. Can I, because humans are humans. Can I do that? I just want to point something out that you just said, and I know this is so out of context, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> um, when cell phones first came out, yeah. I realized that if you had a dog in front of you and you pulled your cell phone out, that dog stopped what it was doing, like it was trying to, you know, like oh. get a, yes. The dogs wait for you to get off your phone. They know your attention is gone. How? I don't know how, but when you said that about people, you know, pulling out their phones, it's become a culture. It's become a behavioral culture, right? Like you can pull out your phone so somebody will walk away or just ignore you. Like in your store. Yeah. Right? Instead of saying hello to somebody, you can have your cell phone in your it's face. It's your shield. It's your shield. Um, so what, uh, what, what, um, let me say, what you are doing with your foundation, do you have to travel a lot? Do you have to, what do you have to do to maintain it? Well, it's interesting because the foundation only pays me 10000 a year, so I have to make a living. And we talked about making a living. Yes. And so some of the time I'm traveling to speak so that I get paid. And some of the time I'm traveling to speak for the foundation. And, it, and then we also have a piece of legislation that we're trying to get through about um, hate crimes. Do you actually go to Pocahontas for that? Pocahontas? I mean, uh, I think I'm saying it wrong. Like in Richmond, where the... No, I'm, this is the national level. No, we're going to D.C. Oh, no, okay. No, no, no. okay. I really don't have anything to do with risk. So how does that work, though? Like, well, yeah. I'm, I'm still learning. But um, okay. I get called in to do press events and things and um, talk to people and confer with people. Next week, I'm going to an art installation, actually, in D.C. Really? You should take me. I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, um, so the art installation is, is like part of a... It's, it's part of the leadership conference, and oh. I don't even know where it is yet. They haven't told now, me. Now, by the way, they do that a lot here for the Virginia Fine Arts Museum in Richmond. Yeah. I've been to conferences where they closed the museum, and then they put like, you know, they have us have lunch there, and then, you know, after the conference, you get to walk around. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really lovely because, like, I think what we're doing here is we're relaxed, right? We're more I'm playing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Are you on three sides yet? I'm on side four. Oh, wow. Look at you. Okay. This is a hot day. Yes. <laughs> this is a, I don't know, a pink sun. Oh. But I like my red moon and oh, star. Oh yeah, that. Mm. I don't know why they're red, but they're red. Oh. So, um, in Charlottesville, I also want to just point out again sort of my historic evolution. Yeah. I spent, I mean, you know, we talk about certain processes. I think everybody in every <laughs> job. It's it, me. No, it's me. Well, I don't get, get on your dress. Yeah, I, I don't care. It's washable. Okay. Um, all the people in Charlottesville um, have jobs, you know. And they, you know, they're nonprofit, but they have jobs in the, within the nonprofit or whatever. And you know, not everything works out the way they want it to. For instance, let's say, um, for instance, I'm working with a climate action group. Okay. Um, so they're climate collaboratives, and for because of the six months, I only have two hours at a time that I can do something. So I try to collect names, like a go-to um, like-minded liberal places. What does liberal mean? It means that people are uh, usually educators or people that are engineers or things like that where they're um, looking for information all the time. They're not stuck on one thing or another. That's what liberal means. It's that. I don't think that's what liberal means. Well, what do you think it means? Uh, it's 
it seems kind of ironic because liberal actually seeks to regulate more. Um, but liberal to me means that you're very interested in taking care of others as, as a society and not just focused on yourself. And um, how can I make brown? I make blue mountains. And um, being conservative seems to me to be more that you're concerned about yourself and your family and you, what belongs to you and less about taking care of others. That's really interesting because that's a definition that has to do with a lifestyle, right? But actually, um, my mountains suck. It depends, I think, also on the individual. Like, say, when you talk about conservative, right? Yeah. Um, I know people in my family, for instance, they elect that for raising their family. I mean, my relatives. Right. Um, but at the same time, we're a family of oh, professionals and college educated and all that sort of stuff. I think that the liberal thing is to me more that they um, are willing to change, they're willing to be interracial uh, or inter uh, ethnic, ethnically different, um, um, that they're not worried about that there's a finite outcome. Right. So, so it's not I, I liberal. See that we're not contradicting one another. We're saying the same thing in a different way. Okay. So for me, liberal is a moving outward to a sense of other, where conservative is moving more inward to a sense of self and what's for me and mine. I need more yellow in this mood. I don't like a red mood. So, um, yes, I understand. Absolutely. And agree. Well, you don't have to agree. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. not required. Well, yeah, it's not, it's a, for me also, yes, nothing is uh, one thing or another. It's always like this gray area or this in-between type of stuff. But um, when it comes to the statue in Denmark that was placed here in 1909. Yeah, what was the significance? So the significance... <laughs> Finally. I'm glad you asked. No. <laughs> the significance finally is that this was really about a story about a mermaid who, if she didn't go and marry a prince, or she, she wanted, the, the real story is not the Disney story. See, the Disney story is a whole different story. Yeah, I read the book a long time ago. Oh my goodness. So here is this mermaid who says, you know, she wants to uh, be human because that's the only way she can marry this prince. Now right. what happened was she went into the water. Oh yeah, the prince crashed and drowned almost in the water. She saved, she saved him. him. Yeah. She brought him to life, whatever. He went back and he was like on the ship or whatever. And then she was like, I love this guy. And then she was like, um, t talking to her grandma, and her grandma said, you know, you, uh, as a mermaid, you'll live 300 years. Right. As a mermaid, you're going to have, um, you're going to, um, you don't have a, a real soul, okay? When you die, you're going to be foam. <laughs> you're going to turn into sea foam, whatever that means. You're going to, like, disappear, and then there's not going to be anything left of you. But if you become a human, that's speciest. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Okay, so, but if you become a human, you're going to die physically, and then you're gonna have a soul, but um, in the meantime, while you're a mermaid, you're gonna have a lot of pain in your feet, and you're gonna, um. She got that part right. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting it really bad. No, I was Do saying, you remember it? Do you remember the story? Uh, not those details, but I said, no, she got that part right about the feet hurting. The feet hurt a lot. Oh, okay. So, anyway. 
<laughs> um, so anyway, ultimately she decides, the mermaid decides, I really love this prince, I'm going to sacrifice myself, and I'm going to do this. And so she, um, in fact, meets him. He says he's going to marry her and all that sort of stuff finally. And then in the end, I forget what happens. In, I don't remember. When I read it, I was end, like 10 years he, old. He doesn't marry her. He, he has to marry somebody else. Probably some princess. Yeah, some princess. And then, and then she dies. A human death or something. And then, like, she's in the wood or something. Or no, her sisters come. And they save her. And, and they make as a her, human? Yeah, as a human, they make her into a mermaid again or something. She had, like, another chance or something like that. Yeah. Okay, but the whole thing was mythologically at that time, and this is what I gathered from the story that I read, is that um, first of all, there was a patriarchy, right? There was like this idea that you live as a woman for your man. You live as a woman to give birth. You, you don't Are have- Are you talking about the story as written or the, the within the context of the yeah. That reality. Yeah. I think because it was 1909. Yeah. Right? Well, and the, look, and the fact that... You see a lot of stories with that bent even today. Yes. Which irritates the fool out of me. Yes. Exactly what I was thinking about in significance of why any artist makes anything permanent or makes, um, you know, a statue. It strikes me that probably we forget that society will change. We think that the way we see the world is the way everyone else will always see the world, and that's just not the case. All right, we got to um, cut this off, and I want to say thank you so much for this wonderful I'm not time together. I know, but guess what you did? You made a statue. <laughs> And this statue is, if you look around it, it is beautiful. Look at it. We made it together, and look how we did. Isn't this amazing? It is amazing. <laughs> but anyway, I want to thank you so much for being here. We're not going to be able to see for the statue. Oh, oh yeah, we are. Because they have screens. Okay, so now we're gonna um hopefully I didn't get paint on you. Oh yeah, probably. So now we're gonna um go this way and we're gonna jump off the water. Do you want me to put this in the water? Oh uh, no, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> okay, let's jump. Wait, wait, wait. We can use our aprons too. No, I don't wanna use my apron. Okay. You don't drown me. Okay. <laughs> you jump first. Okay. There we go. Ready? Put your arms out. Woo! Oh.